like you need to find someone that you can ask questions like and wrong questions and you won't be penalized for it because otherwise you can't grow if you're always just trying to be right all the time. Hello everyone, welcome to the Data Scientist Show. Today we have Pauline Chow. Pauline is a data scientist and former legal attorney and active transportation advocate. She worked in banking, fashion, and education startups and Amazon. Currently, she is the data engineering lead for Thraco, a blockchain research and modeling company. She has a master's degree in computer science, machine learning from Georgia Institute of Technology. She has a law degree from the University of Wisconsin. She is a certified yoga teacher and published writer. You can read her published stories at paulinechowstories.com. While she was a senior data scientist at Amazon, she has worked across teams uh, in HR, devices, real estate, and today we'll talk about how she tackled different problems uh, in different domains of data science and her career journey. And if you have been enjoying the show, give me a five-star five review and subscribe to the channel. Welcome to the Data Scientist Show, Pauline. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be talking to you today. So how did you get into data science? Uh, I think from the start, I, I've been reading this book called um, The Four Tendencies, and, and I realize I'm a, I'm a questioner. So I'd like to ask questions, um, and not all questioners become um, data scientists, but it's a, it's a very, very good career, I think, because it helps you um, formulate quest, you know, your questions and then use data to find your solutions. I think probably a lot of attorneys are questioners too. Um, but when, when I was younger, I, was, I got interested in um, computer science, which is, was, I think was pretty rare at the time. That was, it was a lot of years ago. Um, and, and so I started, I learned programming in high school and then got into statistics. But, but because I had this like very idealistic way about the world, I thought that, you know, I should become like a public attorney, which, which I did. Mm -hmm. So then, so from that, I had some skills, like, I think like, you know, w with technology and, and, and then I thought that I should be using it at some point. And as, a, as an attorney, I was helping people within one system, but I wasn't really learning anything outside of that system. So then, so I got kind of, um, um, kind of curious as to like what other things I could be doing with my life. So then I, I switched back to data science and uh, working with data. Yeah. Yeah. That's so quite an interesting journey. I definitely want to talk more about uh, how your experiences in law um, helped you with your data science project. So in Amazon, uh, what was your first team and your first project? I mean, my, my first team with Amazon was with the devices team, mm -hmm. working with about, I think, 20 economists, looking at different questions the business had about devices, of new devices, uh, the current performance of um existing devices at the time. So that was five years ago. I think like that that's when Echo was kind of like like the newest thing. And and then yeah, figuring out what the market, what else the market wanted in terms of like voice, technology, and functionality. In the device team, you mentioned um you working with economists. Can you tell us share us more about what was the a problem you're trying to solve and what was the data science element you contributed? Oh yeah. So, so then um, I think that team was really interesting because it's the first time I worked with so many economists, they do have some interesting ways to translate small data into like larger data questions. So using surveys and those type of uh, responses and constructing like a Markov decision chain with those to simulate kind of um, wants and needs and then translating that into like a business solution. So, yeah. so for devices, it was around the features that people wanted. Mm -hmm. And then, and then yeah. I think in, in that designing, designing the survey was, I think the most important component of that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, so you, uh, in our previous chat, you, you talked about the measuring the ecosystem of customer contact to determine the values of actions on um, propensity. Can you tell us more about the project? Oh yeah. So so that, okay. So this just to finish off this mm-hmm. survey type of process is is interesting because it 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 measures like desire and propensity and and mm-hmm. and, and the thing with that is. It's trying to measure something that doesn't already exist. Yeah. Right. So, so then, you know, how does someone know, like before, you know, like Alexa and Siri, how does someone know they want this when they've never experienced it before? I mean, I, I, sci-fi movies help, which, which I think that's why there's like some connection with me in like writing speculative and fantasy. Because, mm-hmm. because then being a data scientist in this type of area, area requires you to look to the future. So then the only thing you can do is make up your own stories about what the future looks like. Yeah. So, and I think a lot of data scientists have to do that. You have to like mm-hmm. create a story for yourself. So, so, so you can um, kind of take the world and distill it into like a model. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times they're like, you know, 2d, 3d models. And, and, and not all the dimensions that you need. So, 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 so just the same, the survey is you're crafting your world into like a list of 10 questions. Um, and then, and then the question that you, the project you're talking about that I mentioned was, was, is actually based off of history because, because Amazon and like a lot of maybe companies who have a lot of data about customers, mm-hmm. They, they're able, you're able to kind of measure the relative impact of an action by that customer yeah. o- over many, many years. So, so I think that's, you know, definitely that's a positive to working at a company like Amazon, who's had such a like long lifespan with their customers. So, so just think of me, I, you know, I, I, you know, registered for Amazon when I was before law school. So then you, I can see all the like law school books that I bought and kind of like my interest in books at different times in my life. But then I also, you know, I, I bought a house when, when I, and then I, you know, bought stuff from Amazon. I like got married. I've registered myself on there. So, so, so basically you can, you can look at everybody who kind of like are similar, right? Age and, um, education because oh like you know they don't have that data but they could buy it <laughs> so they can enhance your data as much as they want so then you can find you know and with like a lot of different clustering methods or just similarity very basic similarity measures find out who's similar and then and then kind of compare those people so oh if someone gets married like how much money how much more money do they spend on Amazon when they, if they don't get married Mm. So, you know, so, you know, based on, get based on that policy, you know, like <laughs> that action, someone, people might be like, oh, we, you know, Amazon should support, you know, more marriage because they make more money, you know, it's kind of, you know, not, I, yeah. I, they don't do that, but I'm just saying. Yeah. And then, and then kids, you know, like if you have kids, like how much money do you spend on Amazon versus not, you know, so, so then, so, so you can use techniques to do that because you have so much data then, then your clustering and your similarities become really interesting. And then, and then you can track people as groups and then measure actions with, with money, with like quantity. It's like, oh yeah, if you get married, you, you, for the rest of your life, you spend, let's say like 50% more than anyone else. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm making this up. Yeah. But it, it, it's, it's something along that lines. And then, so then now you have, an idea of behaviors you might have, you might want to influence as a company. Got it. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. It seems like you need to come up with a lot of assumptions and then try to uh, verify the f- assumption or test assumption from the data, whether it's true or not, and find a story there. And also uh, through the, um, the survey asking sometimes an open question. So you mentioned there are some techniques to do that. One is um, clustering. What are some other commonly used um, statistical method or um, maybe machine learning or maybe analytics that are used in this process? Oh, yeah. So that's a great question. I think 
one thing that I, a lot of product companies use is, um, including Amazon, I think is like network analysis. Mm -hmm. So it's also another way of structuring your data, not as a column and row. Yeah. And, and, and I personally really like using networks because it, you, you can look at additional connections. You can look at, yeah, the relationship of products and people and then, you know, who uses them and, and mm -hmm. when. And then so when I say who uses them, it's now, now I'm still talking about when you have really large data set of people's actions and behaviors and, you know, places in their lives. So then, so, so I think that's very useful for enhancing th the data that you already have. Yeah. And uh, so when you say network analysis, how do you do network analysis? Can you just give us a quick overview? For example, I haven't done any analysis using that uh, method. Oh, yeah. So um, you it, so instead of everything being a column in a row, it's um, you can do it directed or undirected. So care, you do care about what direction things go in. Mm -hmm. for, for instance, if you had um, as, as say, for instance, you had like a feedback tool where 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 you someone could say something good about you and you can say something good about them then um, you, you're, you become, you know, like a point and then that person becomes a point. And then so, so um, from that point, you, you can also enhance uh, kind of that connection and, and, you know, put a value on it or mm -hmm. put like the number of times you guys connected in the system. Yeah. Um, and then, and then all your data points become the connections. So A to B, B to C, C back to A. So like the, your data becomes rows of these connections. And then, and then the, after that, uh, you, after you have a connection, you, you sort of have a map that you can use some kind of interesting uh, algorithms to look at. You can look at the shortest path from one, to one, one point to another, how many points are connected to a certain specific dot. And then after that, there's also the more famous use of kind of like a, a, a network loosely is the page rank algorithm, which is what Google uses for search. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of like probabilistically how people move through the network based off of the size or the quality of the connection. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. So you construct the roles into the kind of the relationship between each uh, dots, each um, like units of your interest. Um, and uh, so what, was the data size uh, really big um, in that project? How did you handle the uh, big data problem? Oh, yeah. And yeah, in, in, uh, in devices, it was very, a very large data set. Mm -hmm. So did big data problems versus when I worked in like real estate, it's like a small data problem. And then, and then to a lesser extent in employee data, it's, it's like a, the, the problem there, I don't know if there's an official name for it, but it's like a pretty large, you know, robust data set, but it doesn't move very often. Like you don't get additional data points very often for employees um, in, in like an HR space. But so back to devices, I, I think it depends what the problem was. So so because the good thing, because like a lot of scientists and economists have worked out that the patterns that, you, that we saw at Amazon could be looked at at a high level. Mm -hmm. And also because it is like, there's so many data points that, um, that you could look at people and met business measures with like uh, general metrics, like like a me like a median at Amazon for like how you know how many people bought this product is like is different in in like you know smaller company maybe or smaller data set. Um, we I think a lot of businesses relied on metrics, like like pretty pretty straightforward metrics. But I think that that's why they have they had a lot of. BIEs and uh, data analysts to create their um, w, WBRs. I haven't said that in a long time. WBR WBR is the weekly business review. Yeah, they had WBRs, MBRs, QBRs. Mm -hmm. So, so then um, they could you know, kind of track the trends and, and make sure there's kind of nothing. There's like 
they would pay attention to the outliers essentially because I think at that point that that's what you care about is like outliers because you already have like your trend established. Mm-hmm. So so yeah, with the big data problem, it was it was um, you know using the right tools so you can scale, mm-hmm. and then um, consistency and automation would be kind of the the kind of like big picture solutions to, to big data problems. Yeah. And, and, and I think also when you have big data, then you can focus on simplicity of the process and just assume simplicity unless you have to branch out of that. So then that, that was a good, really good place for, I think like the economist way of thinking, the economist type of modeling, um, because you know, like linear regression usually could, could solve the problem like 80 or 90% of the time. Yeah. And uh, so previously you you talked about um, big data using the right tools um, can be very useful. So for example, what are some tools that you find uh, uh, very helpful for those cases you have worked on? Yeah, so so it depends kind of you know obviously what you're doing. I think for the roles that I were in that I had I had, had to communicate a lot with the business, I actually liked really liked um, Amazon's like different flavors of SQL that mm. that they've created because because I think it when, when the, and the teams that I worked on even the less technical people could read SQL. Yeah. So so then it like removed a communication issue, um, and then. And then some of the tools that are created, like for instance, I think and, and, and anyone can use now if they pay for it, like Athena to mm-hmm. S3. And um, and the and the reason I call that out is because it's 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 a setting where you can give a business user a login to the AWS console. They can go to Athena, you can save your SQL, and then they they can just run it and just change. And then if they need to, like just change a date change like the name of the product and then kind of have this uh, self-service um self-service relationship with them um in in terms of data and um and whatnot but but obviously you know it takes for the data person takes a while for for you to kind of work out the logic clean the data get it to a certain point um and then so so i really appreciated all these tools that internally Amazon had created Mm -hmm. to uh, automate um, creation of data sets. Yeah. Um, And I really like what you mentioned about the uh, simplicity on big data. I think sometimes when we have a lot of data, we think that, oh, we have to use a very complicated model to find a solution. But sometimes simple model works, especially in the context of device when working with economists you want to be able to interpret the results so some mm-hmm. simple simple models like linear solutions you can really understand the coefficients what are some other ways you can simplify your um, data science approach when um, dealing with big data or maybe some other examples when you're um, on that team I think looking at the metrics that you're using and, and the features that you're using is very important. I think, you know, even just playing around with you know, averages, medians, percentiles mm-hmm. is important and then and, and creating models based off of those. And, and then I think there, there are some nuances with like, you know, for instance, if we looked at customer behavior you want to make sure you're, you know, taking into account seasonality, holidays, d- depending on what you need, and, yeah. and then do the right smoothing for it. Like you can do, you know, ninety days, sixty days, even a year, a year smoothing, and then and, and it makes it it essentially takes out the question of like seasonality if every mm-hmm. if everything is like all of your metrics are over the year. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so just using data and features to simplify the questions and try to take out as many com- confounding elements as possible. Mm-hmm. So how do you take out the confounding um, elements? I think sometimes that's uh, hard to detect the confounding effect. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think I don't think there's a one solution for that. It's just kind of what the problem is that you're faced with. I think in in real estate, it was it was a lot of it was seasonality because if you're looking for like a site that you want to put put a store in, mm-hmm. and you want to you look at previous behavior, then a lot of that was a lot of activity is based off of you know, holidays and pe- when people have time off and whatnot. So, so just create creating features and assumptions that you think can, are like equal to each other. Um, and then, and then also, you know, using statistics to figure out, you know, what things are most correlated and trying to figure out um, um, kind of the, the distribution of each of the features that you're using and, 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 and being able to understand in a story, but also through statistics, like what it means to combine mm, the different yeah. features. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you mentioned so you do a lot of uh, feature engineering, and uh, you enjoy the engineering part of the work. So, if you do think about like a breakdown of time, how much of it was working on feature engineering or building data pipelines, and how much of it was doing data modeling work? Oh, yeah. So I think it depends too on which team you join in, in Amazon because there are teams that you like, like a jack of all trades data scientist where you, you you work with the data and you and you all build some models and, you know, and, and, and you write the papers. Yeah. Right. But then there are some teams you where you only write the papers and you you only you ask for data sets from the data engineering team and then the data en- engineering team hands those to you. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so then I, I liked, I liked always like being on a team where you kind of had to do um, more, like um, more variety. So then, yeah, I, I would say like, you know, at least 60% of my time was with the data and then another 10 or 20% was you know, talking to the business. Mm-hmm. And then the last 20% would be like the modeling. Yeah. So when you say with the data is more like data understanding, like you mentioned, look at some distribution outlier, think about Mm -hmm. feature engineering. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of times when people think about data scientist work, people just think about the modeling part. But I think majority part is like you mentioned with the data. It can include a lot of things, either building pipelines or understanding the um, domain knowledge behind the data. And that might not sound as sexy as building machine learning model, but I think that's very important. And that can also be very fun. Like you mentioned, you're discovering the story behind that. And if you don't understand your data, you would not be able to provide uh, those, uh, generate a high quality model with it. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and it's also kind of figuring, you know, within your career is like figuring out like, you know, what you enjoy, what you're, what you're kind of better at Mm -hmm. and then, but then also allowing yourself kind of a little bit space to learn a little bit more. So then, so it's like who you work with, like are the people that you work with supportive of you extending yourself? Cause I think there are teams like, and companies where they, you know, they just want you to come in and just like, you know, just do work, just do all the work, but then not, not concerned with like your interest whether or not like you're engaged because, you know, because not everyone wants to do something outside of their wheelhouse. Yeah. But then, but if you do, then you should find a team that's supportive of that and, we're, and th- that you can learn from them. So it's kind of like lear- yeah, learning your style and kind of being on the right team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. So I also been on probably four or five different teams in Amazon. I think that's the one benefit of working in a large company. You have Mm -hmm. different type of options of teams. And I think also I know the data scientists, for example, in Facebook or other um, maybe social media related company, they're very specific, uh, focusing on product analytics. And then there's machine learning engineering, only working on machine learning related work. Uh, I think in Amazon, we also have applied scientists doing more machine learning. But the data scientists, people ask me, what do data data scientists at Amazon do? I think it really depends on the team. We don't really have a specific uh, type of task assigned to us. So I think that's uh, the fun part of it. And if you 
look at the uh, internal guidelines for like promotion, there's nothing about, oh, you have to know this modeling technique uh, or you have to code in certain languages to be promoted to the next level. It's all about the influence you have on your team the um, or whether are you are expert in a specific domain, but it's up to your background and then also the team. So yeah, thanks for also sharing your um, experience on that. I definitely want to talk more about finding your passion and finding a team uh, later. But I think previously you mentioned some project in realistic. I, I'm curious if you can share more about what type of problem you were solving there. Uh, it seems like there's a shift from kind of big data to like a smaller data set. Yeah, well, I yeah, in the smaller data set space, you have to rely a little bit more on statistics and like the, the way that you, the assumptions that you're going to put in the model, like each feature is really, really important. And, 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 then, and then also like, I guess the outcome, the output, the deliverable is, um, is important, but, it, but also it's, there, there should be understanding that it's like, it's a representation like versus it. It's like a representation of like relatively of what what you think will happen, and it's not a prediction. You know, mm. can't really. I guess like prediction is more like um, it's like a. I don't know. You can say it's a better guess, but but I think sometimes in people who maybe are not technical, they think a prediction is like hundred percent, or it's like magic. It's like yeah. a prophecy, which which it's obviously not. It's just more like. It, it's just like a gauge of kind of what you think the future might be. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is always a probability. Nothing is a hundred percent. I think it's also data science's job to explain sometimes to educate people what does the number mean in, in the report and how much certainty you can take. So what are the, um, can you give us some example of what are some more specific projects you worked on in the um, real estate team? Yeah, well, well, the real estate team, I, the, the team that I, the team that I worked on, it was uh, the bookstores team, which doesn't exist anymore. Mm. They, the Amazon shut down bookstores. Actually, yeah. like probably like I think a couple of weeks after I left that team and like went to this new company, mm -hmm. they 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 like they decided to close oh, all the bookstores. They're like, we don't have Pauline anymore. We have to shut down. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm going to think that now. Thank you. But, but yeah, so it was interesting because I think Amazon had dealt with a lot of, you know, uh, ephemeral space, like, like things that you can change very easily, like a website, you know, e you know, e-commerce, e but, but then you know, they do have a branch of real estate, which has a, it doesn't allow a lot of experimentation. Mm. So, so they, you know, Amazon also owns Whole Foods and right. um, some, they also have Amazon Fresh, I think, and some other, and Go as well for yeah. groceries. And and then this team, I was on this team, like right around when the pandemic hit. Mm. And then they were, you know, kind of struggling through the pandemic. And then... Yeah. And then, and then, you know, the, the team was monitoring, like, how things, whether things were re returning back to normal mm -hmm. in terms of foot traffic. Yeah. But, but then there, there are also things like they, they found in, or I looked in the data, like a lot of people moved from, there's a couple stores that had a lot more drop in traffic relative, relative to other ones. And it's mm -hmm. because people moved to other places. And so, so then it's, there, there's a lot of uncertainty in, in that, but, but it was um, taking the stores that, that they had, which is very, was very small number. I think it was like, I forgot, there's like 24 stores. And then, and then using, using that, their activity and transactional history to figure out what similar sites would perform better or worse than, mm. than the stores that, that they had. Yeah. 
So when you have a very small sample size, how do you perform those analysis? What are some methodology you used? Oh yeah, yeah. I think um, I think it's um, take just just communicating to people what you know what what it means, what the outputs means. Mm -hmm. um, certain types of um, uh, testing, like we used it, we used leave, leave one out, and um, like. For, oh, sorry. What was the the name of the test? Oh, yeah. So, 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 so instead, you know, cro cross fold validation, where you take a take a sample, you take a portion of the portion of the data and use a test and train, but then you split the you split your entire data set up that way. Mm -hmm. Where it's like eighty, let's say eighty twenty twenty is your test, eighty is your train, but then you but you but you can split the data set that way up to like five times, right? Right. So like. And so, so instead of, you know, it'd be eight, instead of 80, 20, I mean, essentially you just leave out one store, you just take out one store, run the model on 23, 23. Oh, so instead of doing like uh, those type of cross validation, when you have large data set, you're doing just leave one out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So one is like, oh, okay. Yeah. So, so it's just like, a, it's just how, how you, how you test and train the model is, is, you know, that's basically the only <laughs> the only way you can have like a robust yeah. robust um, idea of what your what your model can understand and and then and then I think there was a lot of like deep diving into the variations that came out like um, you know is are the error rates or the predictions how, how much error is is within within each run. And then kind of like deep diving. And then, you know, I think some of the results was, you know, we, we did take out, we did take out like one or two stores because there was, it was like over representing the, the um, prediction for, for a revenue. So then, so, so it's like, you know, very detailed work into the, it, it, into the um, data set that you have. Um, and it, and it's also relying on, um, other metrics that, that you can get. I think, I think I also incorporated some features like, um, um, like pro proximity to other, st other stores that were, were useful mm -hmm. that, that were um, impactful to, to the model. Yeah. And then, and then, so like getting a data set on um, how much a customer is spending somewhere else or a relative and then, figuring out if there's like a categories of stores that lifted the sales for your, mm -hmm. for your particular, for or for a particular store and generally across all the, um, all the stores that, that you're trying to measure, I think. And then, and then, so the, the, the you know, the algorithm that we use was ended up just being a, a ranking algor algorithm. So based off of what the, a uh, real estate agents were interested in, they, they would enter a list of sites and then the output would be a rank. So, so then, so, so then, um, you know, because of the limited accuracy of this model, then that was the best we could produce for them. I think so, yeah. so, so it's also not like overly being overly confident in what you can produce was important too, because it was so limited. Yeah. Um, so I would say sometimes you don't know whether how the model will represent the real world, but it's still better than just making a guess. And now after you communicate with a business or when someone make a, a decision when where to launch a bookstore, um, so how do you bring that feedback back to evaluate the, your model or whether my prediction was good? Like how do you um, close the loop? to see to evaluate the results yeah um i think yeah you you, you incorporate we we would do like quarterly and i wasn't on i was on the team for like maybe a year and then and then for a lot of that year the um stores were closed mm -hmm. and there nothing was opening so so we i think that the team did have like a history of updating their models every three months yeah you know with with new samples sample mm -hmm. size like adding one or two stores um, and then kind of just reevaluating their assumptions. Yeah. Because it, it, cause it turned out that model turned out to be um, 
a three feature model. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I, I added like one feature, which is like proximity to, to, to a type of store. Yeah. Um, that, that was appropriate for, for that particular retail space. But then in, in that space, you can't have too many features that, right. that you're using. Yeah, especially when your data is small, and when you have more features, it just adds more um, noise to the model. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you also worked with uh, like location, kind of geospatial data. Is it the same project um, you mentioned? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was um, so in this in this in real estate, the features, the three to four features we had were um, based off of geographical data so then it's how you draw it 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 it, it was represented as a as a point so like 2d but Mm -hmm. then um but then to to extract these features you there were some assumptions and metrics and analysis that that went into deciding um what points like which points to use and then maybe how to draw how to draw the centroid or even how to draw polygon to to extract that data Mm. because you know for for instance if you have like a site in a mall versus a site that you want to put in like you know in a parking lot Mm -hmm. like how how do you compare traffic traffic from any of those points together so it's like deciding deciding how yeah how you draw the area Mm -hmm. and then and then from the data we had sometimes you know had like for instance a mile from the from a point five yeah. miles, six miles or whatever. And then, and then you, you have to draw the area differently given maybe like what area you're in, like rural, mm. suburban. So you can do some smoothing in the data um, before the model. So it's kind of similar when I mentioned, like if you use a feature where it's like lagging over a year, then you kind of smooth out the seasonality. In, in, in this case, you can smooth out features by deciding how to draw comparable polygons or, or, or distances uh, around a particular point. Yeah, um, that sounds very uh, interesting. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for sharing that. So y- you are also using computer vision to evaluate the side surroundings. Can you tell us more about that? Oh man, I have to look. I have to look back at my code. I don't. I don't remember anymore. Yeah. But um. But but it really was. I think our, my main challenge was getting the right photographs. Mm. So there was you Google Street View, but you can't use it for commercial unless you're like I think unless you're Google. So so there you know we looked into some free sources which only had like partial amount of data. We, um, I think one of the the for the POC, we used the pictures from the real estate people because they have to take pictures when, when they go to site visits. Um, but then, but we, we were trying to find like a scalable way to get photographs. I think one one use case, which we, we I didn't end up, you know, going, following through all the way because it wasn't there anymore is trying to figure out if you can put cameras on like Amazon delivery trucks. Mm. To take a pictures to take pictures of the street but the but the problem is you know not all sites that you want to evaluate are are popular enough for for um delivery trucks to pass yeah so you, you would have to develop a pro a system where you like enter the address in somewhere and then and then someone figures out who's uh going to deliver the closest to that point and then ask them to kind of you know do a detour Hmm. But, it, but like, you know, that, that was kind of one of the ideas we floated around there, but, but, but we, we, ne- we didn't get past the POC for that. Before we change topic, are there other interesting projects in the device team or the real estate, real estate team that you want to share with us? Oh, oh, I, think, I think you covered a lot of it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think you, that was a lot of um, more interesting things, mi- minus some, you know, the day-to-day annoyances, yeah. you know, when, 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 when you know, the script that you ran yesterday you come to mm-hmm. work and it doesn't work and then you spend the whole you spend like half yeah. a day fixing it you know so things like that you know that that the non-glamorous stuff that's like part of our our jobs I think I think you covered them more 
glamorous parts <laughs> of my yeah job. i have similar experiences sometimes when you're on the new project you have to get access to a new database get the yeah, permission yeah. so that can last for uh, a few days or sometimes a few weeks and then when you finally mm -hmm. have access you don't the you're approaching the delivery date of your project you only have two or three days to quickly do your model and do the evaluation and think about the uh, how to production your solution so yeah that's just the data scientist life <laughs> oh yeah no no now, now i remember yeah permissionings was like you know pretty pretty hardcore. And yeah. I, but I think, you know, Amazon tried to make headway into it. Like a lot of the IAM or um, kind of IAM features in AWS. Yeah. I think it's a kind of based off of, you know, some sy internal systems that they mm -hmm. have and like in the, the pain that, that you have to deal with, with like take putting people in, but then also when they, when they leave, taking them off or, or also like a lot, a lot of times it was like you, someone left the company, but then, they didn't do anything with the permission. So then like the permissions get like forwarded to some random person. And then that person's just trying to figure out how to like get rid of it because they don't yeah. want to deal with it anymore. Right. Yeah. So um, what are some um, cool projects you worked in like HR? Um, I also worked in HR, by the yeah. way. So yeah, I'm okay. curious to see what you were telling. Maybe we can also compare some notes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, awesome. I, I, I do want to hear what what you're what you worked on. Um, yeah, yeah, worked on some interesting things. I think I wanted to learn about like, you know, for a company like Amazon, like or big company, what are they looking at? Mm -hmm. You know, for for um, people, and and then I. I kind of, I didn't, I touched on some labor issues when I was an attorney. So then I also thought there, there's some interesting overlap with, with that because um, some of it is, I think the DEI kind of in more interest in that within tech companies has been a, a interesting boon for HR because then it, it's, it's initiative where it requires the company to be more proactive about what they're doing and in terms of like, um, and what they're not doing for employees. So then, so, the, you know, they study trends of like who left, who stayed after certain milestones. And, um, and then, you know, they, they, they obviously cared about tenure of people. Um, and then, and then also, um, they, they did a few surveys in, in the year. I think every year they did a tech survey. That was um, a, like a pretty, I guess, big deal within the tech tech space um, and asked about like how you were f enjoying and um, your work at Amazon. And so I think yeah. a, a lot of a lot of leaders use that to determine like what they're doing. They Amazon also use connections mm -hmm. and, and, and we incorporate those as features into different things we're doing. But yeah, but it was sorry to interrupt just for the folks who are not familiar with the, the terms we're talking okay. about. So Amazon Connection is a daily survey, a pop up. So when you open your laptop, there will be questions like, oh, are you happy with your manager? Do you like your job? Are you going to leave the team and stuff like that? So those things are called uh, um, mm -hmm. connections. Yeah, sorry. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. So totally. Thanks for explaining. Um, and so so then I, I like as an employee, when I, and like, you know, in HR and out of HR before, you know, like the, before and after they use connections, they, they actually had data for like managers who were perceived by their employees as like not doing a good job. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think like I, they told managers, at least my managers did this too. They, they would review connection scores with you. Yeah. Right. We do that too. Yeah. I think uh, you have to do that for every, every team. And then it's part of the, maybe I'm guessing the performance review for the managers, they need to maintain a certain level of mm -hmm. score. Maybe the company average mean, I don't know. Yeah. 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 That's as, as what it seemed like. So, so the good part of that was like it, um, it was, they use data as a tool to influence behavior. Mm-hmm. So then I thought I thought that was kind of like a good initiative by like HR leaders to to use data um, to communicate something to a leader. Yeah, um, and uh, you also talked about network effects of employee feedback. So can you tell us more about that? 
Oh yeah, I I, I did a POC to to, to look at um, this. There, there's this there's this one review cycle, and and, and it wasn't for promotion. It was it, it it was a way for I think I'm just extrapolating, but it because because it was like the the whole point of the system was to talk about your superpowers. I think it was called, yeah, it was called Forte, I think. Yeah, it's our annual review um, name, yeah. Yeah, no, but I mean, I think HR was like, oh, there used to be annual review, but then they're like, this is not a replacement for annual review. So mm. it was, you know, it was like different. But um, but then just using that data set to look at kind of um, the idea of um, different types of players in a team or organization. So be, because um, there, there's some really good, interesting... I will send you the link there. There's some, you know, like labor, labor economists that have a theory that like top performers are not the ones that hold the organization together. Top performers don't always um, make the team better. Mm -hmm. So then, so I was trying to figure out a process using like network analysis and, and, and some sample data sources to determine if like you can find out who is, um, like a network player and in, in, in network analysis, you can call them a hub or like, like a, like a highly rated, uh, highly weighed centroid in the system. And to figure out if the, if that correlated with high performers and then, and then if, if they didn't, then could, could we create a system to um, reward people who are these, you know, centers of information and um, you know, uh, important, important people, but not, not in like the core, like the traditional corporate sense. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. So, uh, does it mean this individual is the person that a lot of people will ask them for help for questions for opinion? So this is like someone who really influenced the team. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, um, I had like, you know, obviously limited assumptions that I can make in, in the data set that I use because I, I use a data set that like everyone knew that was available to, mm -hmm. to, um, for, for the company to view. Yeah. So, so, so you're, you're right on point. If there was somebody who was, um, you know, someone asked for feedback pretty often, which, which means that that person worked with, more people um, and then how, how if, whether that person like worked across teams or just on their own team and kind of um, I, I think there's a theory where like if somebody is like working outside their team a lot they're bringing a lot of like external knowledge to their team and doing a lot of the, the connections that are required for you know like permissioning and like analysis that other parts of their team are doing so so yeah that's de definitely one um, feature that I looked at in terms of, in terms yeah. of, uh, like, I guess, like importance in the network. Mm -hmm. And when you say the network analysis, is it a similar analysis you use in the device team that you mentioned looking at the relationships of the people? Yeah. I, yeah. It, it's, it's the same like technique mm -hmm. and like in, in, in oh, code, but yeah with, yeah, with like different, different types of assumptions mm -hmm. and, and players. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, I feel like if you have a few things in your toolbox, it doesn't really matter what is the um, context, what is the domain knowledge. I think that's a cool part about being a data scientist. You can literally work in any uh, domain. And also in Amazon, like you mentioned, those business are actually very different. It feels like, and also the culture are also slightly different, although we all have the same promotion process. Sometimes it, it does feel like I'm working in the, uh, you know, different industry within the company. And uh, um, so, yeah, let me know if you can share the previous re report you were mentioning the labor um, from the, the experts. Yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll send you the link to, I think it's, a, I remember I like, it was a paper and then it might've been like a YouTube link. I'll mm -hmm. send it to you. Yeah. But what, what, what did you work on in, um, in HR. Yeah. Management. So I worked on a project that was fairly new. Uh, at that time, they were having in-person trainings for solution um, architects. So in Amazon, solution architect will work with uh, AWS customers to help them um, develop their projects using AWS tools. 
And uh, the shift is they want to provide digital training to the solution architect. And they want to evaluate how good this training is compared to the uh, previous training. And they want to implement different type of checkpoints throughout the digital training to see we want whether we can evaluate whether a learner has learned something. So we use a lot of Bayesian method in this project um, because when you are learning something online, there will be quizzes. And for example, when you when someone asks you a question, maybe you don't know it, but you guessed the answer. And uh, maybe you know the answer, but somehow you clicked the wrong choice. And uh, so how, how do we come up with the base rate, the assumptions for those distribution and use all of that to evaluate, okay, based on this person's... Um, you know, response to the quizzes, whether this person has really learned the course or do this person need to give it another chance you have a field exam. So it's very interesting. You need to um, think about not just uh, a lot of literatures around students in high school or college, but there hasn't been a lot of literature about the learning behavior uh, for adults, especially for uh, tech professionals. So the challenge would, would be we don't have those type of priors. How do we construct those things? And uh, we also want to make sure this new online learning is not, the evaluation is neither too lenient or too strict, but to match the previous passing rate of the in-person training. So there's also a optimization problem around it. So how do you constrain those parameters in the Bayesian model to make sure this evaluation system uh, is uh, relatively uh, moderate? So it was an interesting problem. And also the biggest challenge is we it's a new product, so we don't have uh, a lot of data. So we... Uh, generate a lot of synthetic data. And uh, I also stay in a team, maybe, I, I think I stayed after the project was first launched in a small cohort. So we do have some feedback from the customer, but when we're developing the solution, we have to use synthetic data, do a lot of uh, a simulation. Um, I think sometimes you just don't have the real data and it's not something you can buy from somewhere. And uh, the data scientist's job is to, uh, I think you mentioned, to think about the uh, assumptions and uh, to evaluate where are the different outcomes. It's like you're writing a story, a novel. You have different assumptions and they have different outcome and then to communicate that to the uh, stakeholders and mention that, hey, those are just my assumptions. In reality, it can be different. It's not magic. It's not 100%. But I think overall, the project was uh, successful based on the small cohort we tested the model on. It seems like we have reduced the overall learning time people uh, take uh, when they try to go through this training and uh, remain a similar kind of pass rate to the uh, in-person training. So that was a very interesting project. I was always curious about, oh, who was looking at the uh, connections, the, the daily service data? And it's very cool that you had uh, used some of those data. And then uh, I actually had connected with... Uh, the principal data scientist, her name is Andy Baker. She designed the connection service. So uh, she, I also will have her on the podcast. So we'll talk more about how uh, we design the surveys in Amazon and how to use um, the survey data and machine learning to do people analytics. Yeah, so... Uh, now we talked about your adventures in the three different teams, and also you have a background in uh, law. So has those experience helped you with uh, your data science work? Oh yeah, I think I think uh, depending what kind of data scientist you want to be, I think I think understanding like human behavior or like and having some soft skills in terms of communication, 
emotional intelligence is important. And, and yeah. obviously I'm not saying all lawyers have, have, have all this, yeah. but, but then, you know, it's just like just increasing your con- contact with people definitely mm-hmm. kind of is a good experience in different contexts, um, dealing with people in like very, um, kind of emergency situations. Cause I did uh, some family law, but I also did um, eviction defense mm-hmm. in, in, in California. So obviously those processes are really, really hard on everybody. So it's, um, so it's kind of, you know, understanding your own emotions and their emotions. Um, and then, and then I, I, when I worked in like public policy advocacy, I worked in um, talking to, Re, like regional transportation agencies. So a lot of staff, but then also a lot of elected officials and, and then um, policymakers who, who determine how much money goes into like creating uh, sidewalks and bike lanes versus, um, versus highways. So, so then it's talking to people under, and then trying to work with them, trying to collaborate with them and trying to find like a, like a, uh, a frame of reference that you, you everyone can un, uh, understand, you know, cause I think in this, in like the policy policy role, it was, there's, there's a lot of different angles you can go with, like changing the allocation of funding. You can go like in a climate change route, but you know, if they're Republican or, or not a climate <laughs> enthusiast, like that's you, like, you don't talk about that. Um, but then the organization I worked for was really uh, focused on uh, childhood obesity prevention. So that was usually like a good um, frame to put around mm-hmm. um, increasing biking and walking to school, just for health of the community and health of children. And then, um, and, and then so, so that, that type of collaboration is different from like people who are like more envi- environmentally focused and then and, and then there was like a group of people who were just like super cyclists but those were kind of like outliers so then but but then you can kind of like bring everyone together on certain issues to to kind of get things done so so I think that type of work really just put the stakeholder work stakeholder management which is I think is pretty core part of data science work as you move up you know, I think if you're like, you know, entry level, you might not have a lot of stakeholder management, but as you move up, you, you definitely have to learn how to communicate and, f- and then use that information to filter the problems that you work on. And then, so then people perceive that you're like effective and that, um, and that to a lesser extent that, um, that you are a problem solver. So mm-hmm. then, so, so I think I mentioned this book that I've been reading, The Four Tendencies, where I'm a questioner, but there's, but, but there's also the other, another form of um, kind of responding to expectation is like, you're an obliger. So I think like people who like obliging people externally. So if, if, if someone asks you to do something, an obliger will, will be much more motivated <laughs> than like a rebel or like a questioner so so like I think in a corporate setting people want people want obligers and not everyone is an obliger but then you can kind of learn some skills about how to create a perception that you are solving people's problems and helping everybody kind of in this like with with some of these soft skills yeah so what are the four different types Okay, well, the four tendencies, there's a holder, obliger, rebel, and questioner. Mm. So, so that's, it's, it's an interesting construct that I'm like kind of looking at. It's like, it's not really based on personality, like INTJ. It's more like, how do people respond to internal expectations and external expectations? Yeah. So it, it, I think it's kind of fun sometimes to like, if you could understand like what your coworkers are, mm-hmm. you, know, you, you can like work better together with like certain expectations. Like for instance, like an obliger, they might ask you, Hey, can you help me? Can you nudge me? Mm-hmm. Like, can you like send me a reminder when I need to get it done? Yeah. Then like they're, they're asking you for help. So you, you know, sending that extra email is like would help them, you know, stay on course and things like that. Yeah. Oh, cool. And a rebel probably will hate things like that. Yeah, yeah. A, a rebel will like supposedly do, you know, they're not, they don't have external 
expectations or, mm-hmm. and they'll just, they have their own principles that they'll just like, they'll just go by their principles no matter what anyone else says. Yeah. So, so I think working with a rebel w- would be like identifying somebody's good traits and what they bring to the company and then letting them do what they need to and not applying too much pressure on them. Yeah. Cause that will cause like the, the counter effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I think people are definitely more complicated than uh, the dimensions of, uh, you know, the, you mentioned Maya Briggs or this four type, but I think it does, it is helpful uh, sometimes to have a framework to understand at a certain layer, especially on the um, professional settings, how to work with your colleagues. And if you don't know, if you don't know how to categorize them, um, you can just ask. I remember in my previous team in Amazon, um, I worked with a great manager and she would ask me questions in our very first one-on-one. She said, what is it like when you are um, grumpy? You know, how do you like to receive uh, appreciation? Do you like to receive it in public or just throughout one-on-one? So um, I really appreciate it. I think sometimes maybe you can just, when the first time you collaborate with someone, could be your manager, could be your um, coworker, you can ask them, hey, what is the best way to work with you? Like, do you like to have a lot of meetings or work uh, async? What is your preferred hours? And uh, now we're all re- remote in different location and things like that. Oh, yeah, that, 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 that that's a great point. That's awesome that your manager asked you that. Yeah. I think those those kind of uh, understanding awareness about the people you work with, especially from different background from your previous experience uh, as a lawyer, uh, definitely helped your career in data science. Or I think it's helpful for any type of career. And uh, what are some uh, specific about law that have helped your project? For example, your understanding of uh, you know data privacy laws and policies like GDPR those type of things. Oh yeah. 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 I think there, uh, when I was at Amazon, there's a lot of projects that came up mm-hmm. with that angle. So it's, so it, it, I was able to like, um, work, work with the frameworks that were, um, put into place and also like suggest other frameworks and suggest ways to kind of merge like a technological definition of something that was written in a policy. Um, and, and interpretation is important. And, and, and now, um, I'm working, working in a space with like blockchain, um, and like smart contracts. And so that, that much has, has a very uh, legal framework to it Mm -hmm. too, in the smart contract, um, type of approach. But then, but there's, you know, a lot of smart contract developers who don't have a legal background, but so, so that's kind of where, um, I can really kind of hone in on, on a specific area. Um, I think being in legal, I think one thing is just asking questions and the right questions is, I think was a very important skill to have to get. Yeah. Are there any books you recommend to help us ask better questions? That is good. I, that is a great question. I will, I will um, think about that and send you something. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember where I saw it, but I know, I think if you are doing a law degree, there's an entire semester just talking about things like, framing how do you frame things and maybe it's a you know a different program but i think it's important for for lawyers to understand how do you um paint a picture what are the assumptions out there and different words different language can completely change the perception uh, of the case you present and i think data scientists should also um go through those type of trainings to understand how do you frame a problem and maybe your framing could be different when you present to different stakeholders and audience also for yourself to understand a problem um so yeah just uh something yeah no, I, no, totally. I think yeah totally like how you how you present the facts is really important mm-hmm. and then and then i think it's what also kind of separation of facts and law. Yeah. So law is kind of how you interpret the facts, right? So then mm-hmm. I think that separation has been important for me, like professionally, even personally a little bit, because then because then in a per, like personal setting, you can take a step back and then like kind of tell tell yourself 
to try to be as unbiased as you can with with the facts and then and then and then bring your own emotions into it later yeah thanks for sharing that i think in previous my uh, interview with nick handel we talked about it's important to have opinions as a data scientist but it's also important to separate the facts and opinions when you present to people your opinions would be something similar to like your interpretation to the yeah. law right yeah yeah and then and, yeah and then, and then so it also helps you tell you when your opinions are important because sometimes you know it some things do, don't matter like I think, you know, I think Amazon, I really like it. They, they use the two-way door, mm. one-way door analogy. So if it's a two-way door, you can make the decision, but you can come back easily. If it's a one-way door, you basically make this decision and you, you basically have to start over if you want to go the other route. So then, so kind of separating, you know, facts and emotions or facts and logic or what, whatever you're separating, it, it allows you to give you a little bit of space to say, okay, does my opinion matter here? And then, and to use your opinion effectively, because if you also, if you have too many opinions, then your prior is like, you know, you're always giving opinions, but if you're selective about your, about when you give it, then I think people might listen more. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, so can you tell us a little bit where you're working on right now? Oh, yeah. Right now I'm working with a team that is um, creating um, products for a few private clients in, in the blockchain space. So it's ad adopting different use cases for the blockchain um, and, and really diving into the, the kind of the protocol and the like, CS techniques that kind of make up unique blockchains. So so crypto, we don't work directly in cryptocurrency, but cryptocurrency is is obviously the most popular use case for blockchains. And so each, you know, each different cryptocurrency leverages a different aspect of like the CS and math backgrounds of, of each of them. Um, you know, for like Bitcoin versus Ethereum, um, and then also Ethereum. Ethereum, they it was it was on a I think proof of work. Now it's becoming proof of stake. So then like it's just like kind of different principles that um, are enacted to ensure like consistency, liveness, and like accuracy on, on this on this blockchain, which essentially is like a database. Mm -hmm. Blockchain is a certain type of database that that is like can be more trusted based off the principles that, 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 that has someone has designed it with. And, and, and so like, um, I'm really excited about this team because they, they, they are very, uh, technical. The, the, the CTO is a professor at, of math, um, at, at USC. So then he, you know, he, he brings a, you know, really specialized background that, that I can learn from a great deal. And so, so the kind of, I leaned into more of my kind of data and software engineering, mm. um, interest there. So I can help these teams like unblock them and provide like a service that, that, that they need in, in this space, but also at the same time learning a lot about blockchains and smart contracts. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, it sounds like a great industry and a great time to um, be in blockchain. And uh, so previously, you talked about understanding yourself and uh, um, finding your voice. Um, can you share more about like how did you find your voice um, at work in your career? I think everyone has to kind of go through this. And it's different people have to experiment like it's different different ways and and I, I and I my assumption is that's kind of linked to like how you grew up like if if you're if you're grew up and people are like just be yourself and do whatever you want like you know you you might potentially have already have access to that but then maybe some people haven't you know and then or or we've been too busy like you know trying to sometimes doing well in school means you you're able to cater yourself to the situation. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, if teachers like say a, and then you say a, and you, you know, get a good score, then, then you know how to do that very well. But then now that when you're outside of that space and you have some room to, to um, either make your own decisions like professionally or personally that like no one's telling you how to get a good score. So then 
that's when you have to, I think, one, develop your own set of, um, you said frameworks or metrics or whatever you want to do <laughs> and, and, and like decide what is successful for you mm-hmm. and yourself and not what, not, not what you've learned in other places. And, and I think for like data scientists, like, you know, we usually go through a lot of schooling. Yeah. It could be sometimes difficult to have, have that framework already, but, but then I think is this really like experimenting, like trying new things. Um, but, but also as, as I do like question how you define success mm-hmm. and then, cause then that's not all, what will always make you happy. But, but it could, you know, obviously uh, a lot of people are probably happy with what they're doing. Um, and then, yeah, this is like knowing that you can reinvent yourself. I think I've reinvented myself many times mm-hmm. <laughs> and I continue to do it. I think it's fun, but it's also like my personality is like that. Yeah. But, um, so for example, you become a certified yoga teacher and started writing. So how was that shift? How was that reinvent happened? Oh yeah. So when, oh, I think this is when I was like in my, after, after undergrad, I, I did, I, I did the yoga teacher training because I thought, you know, I wanted to have a tool to teach myself and other people about like, you know, I guess body awareness and like, um, and then also a different, yes, something that you're not taught in school because like, I guess using your mind in, in different ways like your school and like your, your, maybe your parents only teach you specific ways how to like, you know, use your mind as power. Kind of, you, you can like kind of sometimes make things happen like with your own, like kind of with your own energy, with your own positive thinking, but also like, um, you know, like the, there's other principles like that people talk about like grit Mm -hmm. and like, um, you know, um, dealing with failure. So, so I think like having, having perspective, which, which in itself could be like physically could be like meditation and yoga practices Mm -hmm. that would help somebody. And I I believe this help everyone, um, take a step back, Mm -hmm. you know, and then help, help you. I think it would help you emotionally and even like mentally, like, like we talked about separate facts and, and, and law or facts and your emotions. Like it, 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 it's a process that you train your mind to do Mm -hmm. like, not just intellectually, but like, kind of like, you know, meta, I guess, metaphysically and, and, and also in, in, in ways you can't quantify, but, but although if you're a neuroscientist, you can probably Mm -hmm. quantify the differences. Yeah. So then like, yeah, so, 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 so I think it's like a helpful tool to have to, for just like well-being. Yeah. And uh, you also talked about um, different stages in your life and uh, reinventing yourself kind of for like survival. I think in the earlier of our career, we all have this anxiety. Oh, am I doing good enough? Am I, you know, getting fired? Uh, how do I get to the next level? But then when you are at a certain level, for example, I think we were both senior data scientists at Amazon, but that's a stage where the myself five years ago was thinking, oh, I'll be happy when I'm there and I will be so satisfied. But when I was there, there's a different type of uh, um, kind of confusion in life that I have. And then I was like, oh, what is the, what's next? And I'm going to the next level. I don't know how you felt about it. And then... Um, yeah, kind of curious about how do you optimize, find the metrics for happiness and how do you see the levels, um, in big companies? I think it depends on the person, right? Like whether promotion will make you happy Mm -hmm. because promotion is an institutional structure. So it's like school is institutional. It's like a structure to tell you you're doing a good job, but like, but then who decides that you're doing a good job? Yeah. Right? So you kind of have to like, so I thought about like, do I care that I'm doing a good job? Like good job at Amazon is like, was um, doing more work, doing a lot of it, I think. And then, and, and, and then to a reasonable extent, like doing higher quality work, 
but 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 then the thing that I always found that it was the the quantity of the work was all, always required there, and so and so and, and then sometimes depending on the company, when you get promoted, um, you 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 actually are expected to do more work or harder work, and and I don't think everyone wants that, you know, like so so then it's kind of figuring out if like that's something that you want. And, and then, and then also I found this weird thing. I don't know if you agree with this, but like, um, I, there's some, sometimes there's tricks to getting promoted. It's not, it's not like L4 to L5 to L6 in the same exact position. Like some people change job families, you know, like, and then get promoted a different way. And then I think in the SDE space, and so instead of being SD four, five, six, some people will go SDE. And then TPM, mm-hmm. which is a technical product manager, mm-hmm. and then go and then do SDM, which is mm-hmm. software development manager. Yeah. So then, so they're not going up the IC route directly to um, a manager. They're mm-hmm. kind of taking a little bit roundabout way to do it. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then one of my one of the best managers I had at Amazon, he he was like an English major, and then he did like vendor management, and then he was a BIE for a while and he got like you know he went up the way but BIE but then he jumped over to like product management became like a, t- a leader through there in in because I well for for logistically for BIE you can only get to like seven and then it stopped so you had to like you have to jump ship somehow but but then um but then I I also think like having something that maybe you're interested in that's not necessarily rewarded the same way. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was like, I found out that how much I really like writing and expressing myself through fiction and then expressing ideas through fiction. Like I like the work of collaborating with people and unblocking them with like a skill that I have. So like date, some data engineering and software skills, but then if, if I'm able to write every day, then like I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for uh, sharing that. Um, and so now, how do you see you grow, um, whether as a writer or as a data engineering lead? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, t- totally. I think, like, my role is a little bit hybrid, so it's not, like, pure data engineering. So it does, I do, do a little bit of data science, but but um, but um, that's not, like, what I'm, I guess, um, measured on. But I, I also, like, realized... Um, that I like teaching. I, I did like a, some some teaching at General Assembly in their data science program and, and analytics program. And so so this particular company that I went to um, gave me management opportunities. Mm-hmm. So I have a team member now, and then I, I'm hiring another team member, um, also kind of in a hybrid role. Um, and then so so then it's so management part of it is managing a process, but also, I, I in my opinion, like upskilling people. Yeah. So then um, they can achieve the next level. So I'm I'm at a point where like I prefer to use my skills to like unblock people what they're doing, but also upskill other people mm-hmm. and help them achieve their career dreams because I don't I don't necessarily you know like need to, and not all managers like this. I mean I can I think I can move up as a manager better because I like the allocation of like people management and, and a little bit of like, you know, expertise in a particular area, yeah. but I don't, but, but, but I can like rely on a team for us, for multiple people to like create a good, a better solution together instead of being the one person that is relied upon to create a, create that one solution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that you're very good at understanding yourself. I think all those um, parts that you liked, uh, it seems like you have done a lot of uh, self-discovery um, through probably the books you mentioned or just being very aware of the day and activity. Oh, do you enjoy this? Um, or how do you feel about those type of things? So um, thanks for sharing your experiences. Um, so now you you mentioned uh, you have you have changed your uh, career maybe focus more on writing. So how do you measure your success now versus how you measured your success five years ago? Yeah, yeah, I think that like okay, so 
before Amazon, I, I actually, I feel like I had more also activities that I liked. Really, I was like, really like rock climbing. Mm-hmm. I've, I've done that for like 15, 20 years. Um, so, I, so I went outside in nature a lot when I lived in California. So, so I think a measure of my success was like, you know, how many, how many hours I spent outside. Um, and I, I have another, I have a really good developer friend who she, she, she's an artist. So she like, she paints, you know? So then, but then when I went to Amazon, I tried to like be, you know, get, I got sucked into the culture. So I kind of didn't have like, I didn't engage in like outside activity as much, you know, it's like really sucked into the culture. And I realized that that kind of wasn't, that wasn't me. Um, so then, yeah, so, so now it's, it's like I said, like how many, how, how many things I could do at work to unblock people. Um, and then also obviously like some metrics, like how much, you know, how much data do we have, you know, how many data sets I can, you know, create for when, like based off of requests and things like that. And then, um, and then it's also, I think for writers, you can either have like an, a, a writing goal by hour or by words. So, so then I, I really go by time is like how much time do I spend? I try to spend like one or two hours a day working, like writing or just thinking about writing. And, um, and then, so I've, I've, all, I've, I have some short, short stories that I've submitted to journals. Some of them were published, some of them are still pending. And then I've been working on a, um, a full length, full length novel. And I've been working on it for like <laughs> four years now. So, so eventually, <laughs> eventually it'll be published. Yeah. It's like, it's a long game for mm-hmm. writing. Yeah. And uh, now looking back at your uh, journey, what are some mistakes you have made in your career? I think I, I relied on, so, so there's, this is a double-edged sword because I think I relied on like institutions too much, like school, like degrees, mm-hmm. um, maybe too much to pivot. I think I, I think, I think I should have picked something um, that was allowed me more, like a different, different lives. So like, I think like engineering and like data science does like allow you to do like so many different things. So that like, that's definitely a good spot. Like law, law is really like constrictive, but at the time I like really thought I wanted to do like public policy work. So I, I, so I got to do that. So I'm like, was very excited about it. Um, But so, so I think maybe I would have focused all, although, um, Although I, I did, I did have this idea as undergrad. I, I, I had a statistics undergrad, so that's kind of like very broad. So that's good. But then I think I don't know if I would have gotten a law degree again. Yeah. But but it's, since I have it, I so there's value in it. Like right. I I know the system. I like I feel empowered in certain aspects, and and then I do one day maybe expect to like go back into like more uh, public law again, mm-hmm. maybe one day. But it's like you know, like I dream about that like all this stuff all the time. So I don't know. What do you mean by public sector? Like what what, what would you do in the public sector? Oh yeah, you, you can work on a government, like in a government agency. I could probably do, I could do patent law probably if I wanted to, like for the for the patent um, department. You, you, like for first, every agency has like their own lawyer. So it's like, if there's a particular policy area you're interested, like consumer fraud or something like that. Mm-hmm. They, you can work there. Um, you can, I can also work like, like as a legal aid attorney, can work as like a public defender also. Yeah, cool. So who are someone who have inspired you or uh, mentor you? And uh, what are some best advice you got from them? So yeah, well, well, one of my one of my best bosses, my first boss at Amazon, he he was a, we, we kind of had like a similar personality, but he he was also really like honest with me. Yeah, and then and so he basically taught he he taught me all the secrets of like how if you want to leave a team, like how you do it, because <laughs> because there's a way that you do it, like you don't how do, you how do you change team. teams in Amazon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was really honest with me. He's like, he's like, this is how you do it. Don't do it the way that they tell you to. Mm -hmm. Oh, and so you able to share like what what did he tell you? Yeah, yeah. But but basically, do everything informally. So like, you know, you do your informal chat with the managers, and then get a verbal offer before you apply. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah. So because 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 then it allows you room to experiment, you know, and mm -hmm. then like. 
if you don't get accepted on one team and like, it's not part of your record. Yeah. You know? And so that was really good advice. I think he, he, he valued someone who was like, you know, Jack of all trades type of thing. And so, and then, and then the team that I was least happy on that, that person did not appreciate that, you know? So it's kind of like, but then that manager, I, I got, I was, transferred my my manager like left and I got transferred to another manager yeah so like it kind of wasn't my choice but Mm -hmm. but then um it's kind of like knowing evaluating your manager in that way like do they appreciate me like not personally but just like what kind of person do they want on the team and I clearly wasn't Mm -hmm. that type of person so like you know I knew after I got transferred that person I'm like oh yeah I'm probably gonna leave this team or Amazon like from from this from this team yeah so the best advice I usually get is like honest advice and I can like you know feel the authenticity from that advice Mm -hmm. so um yeah and then so then that's that's how I give advice too Mm -hmm. yeah and so now say if you're mentoring a data scientist what is uh, your best advice for them my best advice for a data scientist and like working with them is is kind of um showing your work it's like kind of feel I feel open to like making mistakes but then here but the caveat is you have to work with someone that you're okay with making mistakes and and so that might not be your manager that could be like a colleague like you like you need to find someone that you can ask questions like and wrong questions and you won't be penalized for it because you know otherwise Otherwise, you can't grow if you're always just trying to be right all the time. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, um, what about like for someone's career in general? Uh, what are some of your advice for them to um, discover themselves and find happiness and find the you know work life balance? Yeah, I think it's um, setting your boundaries just for what works for you and then finding someone or employer that, that will, will fit that. I mean, we're we're lucky in data science because right right now it's um, pretty still highly sought after. So you could choose to a certain extent or, you know, or, or if you can't choose, then you hopefully have like some sort of exit plan. If the, if the environment is toxic or it doesn't, live up to your current standards. So like you, you can keep looking. I think that's, that's good. Of, that's like a good thing to look at. Um, and, and I think it's always good. I think not to have all your experience in one place or in one sector, you know, like even, even if you stay at the same company, definitely try to vary, vary what you look at and vary, vary who, you know, at the company too. So, so you can get some more perspective. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, before we wrap up, what is something that you're excited about in your life or in your career right now? I'm excited about working on these like um, really interesting like problems at work. Uh, eventually, I hope I can share it with you. But then it's like, it's, you know, working with some of these research scientists, I'm like really amazed at the solutions they come up with. And, and, uh, and so like, and then, you know, and then, and then they asked me for data or some sort of other support for it. So I'm like really excited to be part of those like ideas, those new ideas. Um, I think also, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm excited to share like my story eventually. I'm, I'm like rewriting it again, but you know, every rewrite, I'm like, oh, this is, this one's it, you know? So I think, I think this one's it, but you know, yeah. who knows? Um, and, uh, also curious, now you moved to the data engineering role, uh, mm-hmm. but you have a degree in like statistics, machine learning previously. Also, I know you worked a lot with data, but also the modeling. Do you miss uh, working on the modeling part? No, I, I don't necessarily um, miss it, but but in my current role, it, it is it's a little hybrid. So I do interact with um, the simulation that... that um, this company has created. And so, and so I have to understand it 
to test it Mm -hmm. and to feed data into it and then to like analyze the outputs. So I do have to use all that, all that knowledge that I had before. Mm -hmm. It's just like in a slightly different way. And it's also because I know that like the research scientists working on this problem, like they're better at solving this problem than me. So, yeah. So then, so I feel like I'm hopefully, hopefully absorbing, absorbing, their intelligence somehow yeah yeah cool so yeah i'm pretty psyched about that yeah and uh, for people who want to uh, follow your um journey in the future or your writing where can they find you online i'm on twitter a lot it's i'm on it's pauline chow my twitter handle or or i do post the stories that are published on pauline chow stories.com great um, and also, uh, I will follow up with you to link the books or the paper you mentioned mm-hmm. in the show notes. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thanks for coming to the Data Scientist Show and sharing your projects, your stories. And uh, I think the audience can learn a lot um, from your experiences. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm really glad um, you had me. And, and, and actually, like a few of my short, short stories have like, um, are like a little bit fantasy, but horror. And it deals with like, the office setting because I know I find some little bit of hypocrisy it's like or funny stuff about the office too yeah. so so then this this might be a good audience for 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 you to um read some of those stories yeah <laughs> um yeah I will check it out okay thank you so much for having me it was really nice to speak with you and um get to know um the content that you have too online thank you